uh, the Labour Party is a socialist party and proud of it. Its ultimate purpose at home is the establishment of the Socialist Commonwealth of Great Britain, free, democratic, efficient, progressive, public-spirited, its material resources organised in the service of the British people. Okay, that sounds quite impressive. But, <laughs> you know what's coming, socialism cannot come overnight as the product of a weekend revolution. Damn. Um, the members of the Labour Party, like the British people, are practical-minded men and women. That is to say, we'll take things very gradually, very slowly. There'll be lots of compromises. No need to worry about reds under the beds. Okay, so what were the elements of their program that seem in that socialist mindset, that seem to you um, socialist? Chip. Herb. Ah, right, absolutely. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, indeed. Absolutely. Seizing the mean, the nationalisation of the principal industries. Probably the greatest claim of the uh, post war Labour government to be socialist in orientation. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, briefly now. So, at the heart of this document is not so much a commitment to public ownership of the commanding heights of the economy, but a commitment to full employment. Okay? And I think that's a really important difference. Okay? And it's a really important difference because we have to remember that in the first half of the 20th century, and particularly in the 1920s and 30s, the condition of unemployment had become naturalized. It had become routine, rather as it has in society today, both in the US and the UK, where we routinely think, huh, 10% of the population is unemployed, so what? We don't really need a jobs bill. Okay? Well, here we're talking about a commitment to full employment that the government will ensure that there is no long-term structural unemployment, that that is a, a illegitimate, it's a chronic waste of human resources, it will not happen. Okay? And so it's in that context that they articulate the importance of the state owning the means of production, because without the public ownership of the means of production, the state has no real way of ensuring the, uh, the delivery of full employment. And so really at heart, the Labour Party in, 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 in office is more Keynesian in or orientation than it is socialist. Okay? And remember, Keynes, in a way, was set up to find a middle path between the free market and of socialism. Okay? This was a system of demand management and demand management through the public ownership of the means of production. So the first thing that they do is set out to nationalise and take into public ownership key areas of the state. The Bank of England, the first thing to do um, uh, to be nationalised. Um, uh, uh, incidentally, the first thing that Tony Blair does when he becomes um, uh, the the um, Labour Prime Minister in 1997 is to privatise the Bank of England, return it basically back to the private sector, therefore um, uh, showing what a great distance um, at the Labour Party had travelled between 1945 and 1997. So the Bank of England goes first in 1945. Uh, the coal industry, remember, the source of all the bitter industrial disputes um, from the late 19th century onwards in 1946. Air, road and rail in 1947, gas and electricity in 1948, and finally the iron and steel industries in 1951. So that by 1951, two million workers, 10% of the workforce, were in the public sector, okay? thus giving the government serious amount of control over wages and um, over employment. 
But that wasn't the only thing, because alongside those nationalized industries, you have the growth of the institutions of the welfare state I'm about to describe to you, the schools, the hospitals, um, at, at the community, uh, that doesn't work, um, the schools, the hospitals, um, the schools, the hospitals, uh, the schools and the hospitals. Um, <laughs> and indeed many other types of social workers um, uh, that you have, like, um, uh, like social workers. <laughs> I'm so elegant and refined today. Um, uh, you have basically 400,000 of these welfare workers, workers in the in welfare state uh, in 1945, um, three times that of 1939, and they, that grows rapidly in the 1940s and 1950s. Alongside that, interestingly, you also have the development of the warfare state, that is, the growth of nationally owned defense industries. Okay? And the recent historian called David Edgerton has said to us, we have to remember that the welfare state was also built around a warfare state, the, basically the Britain's at great nationalized contribution to the arms industry, which of course had been in private hands since the 18th century. There are over 400,000 workers in the defense industries by 1957. Indeed, that means that there are more technical civil servants and industrial workers in the defense industries in 1957 than there were civil servants in the civil service in 1929. Okay? So in 1929, the entire civil service is about 450,000. By 1957, the defense industries alone account for that number of workers. Okay? So it's an important um, and massive growth in the size of the, of the state. Now, all of this occurs, and I want to emphasize this, all of this occurs in the conditions of acute financial austerity. Okay, this is a graph that I've shown you before of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, size of the uh, national debt as a percentage of GDP um, starting from um, the um, 1840s uh, uh, all the way down. First peak is the First World War, remember, and the second peak, the one that's really high, is the Second World War. Okay? This is 2011. This is our current so-called massive financial crisis that requires the stripping away of all types of public sector um, support. Okay? Massive, massive cuts going on in the UK at the moment under uh, austerity measures. So in actual terms, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the state of the national debt in 1945 was off the charts higher than it is now. And at that very moment, okay, at that very moment, it's then that they don't strip away the welfare state and the public services, they actually construct them. They actually put in place the very system uh, of which the last remnants of which are now being taken away. Okay? So the point is, in 1945, as in 2009 to 2011, how you deal with a financial crisis is not driven by economics, it's driven by politics. You make a political choice about the society that you want to build. Okay? So in 1945, they decide, okay, we're not going to introduce austerity measures, we're not going to do uh, the IMF um, thing, and oh, didn't the Greeks... Um, unsettle um, everybody yesterday. Oh, dear me. You could almost see Angela Merkel um, uh, her eyes in the back of her head. Um, massive scale of de national debt. Uh, £22 billion pounds worth of war debt Britain has in 1945. That's £2,000 pounds per capita, which was about the same as the American um, uh, size of the national debt. Um, and 238% of the GD, of GDP, okay? um, as opposed to 125%, um, it had been 125% in 1939. Now, 
as we'll see next week, or maybe in Thursday, I forget where I am, and part of this was funded by American loans. Just as in the First World War, Britain went to, to the US and said, look, we need money to, to pull this off. And they borrowed, I think, uh, close to 900 million after the First World War. And then when 1931 happened, they said, sorry, you're never going to get that money back. Um, and they never repaid. But the loan that they took out with the US in um, at 1945, uh, 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 um, uh, actually in 1950, with 930 million pounds, um, line of credit of 930 million pounds, and a an direct loan of 145 million pounds. And it was to be paid back over 50 years at an interest rate of 2%. Britain just about four years ago finished making those repayments, um, literally, um, in uh, I think 2002 was the last um, uh, year that they repaid um, the, the loan. So, massive national debt, and the real element of this that seems most, that real last element of being in a huge financial hole that seems, um, that strikes people on the street like you and I, was the persistence of rationing. Okay? They actually weren't that conscious of the size of the national debt because there were all these big building programs going on. There was no great uh, rise in unemployment or anything. It was rationing that persisted and, 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 and was deeply unpopular. So food remained rationed in Britain until 1954. Clothing, coal and furniture remains rationed into the late 1950s, into 1958. So it takes Britain you know, over a decade to emerge from its wartime um, austerity uh, regime. Last point I want to make here is that nationalization wasn't meant to be a top-down process. Okay? Uh, they desperately wanted workers to be actively engaged in the management of nationalized industry. Okay, and so they created these things called Joint Production Committees, JPCs. Okay, and they were meant to be a consultative forum for management and workers, so that workers would be fully involved in the running of um, uh, industries. They were a stunning uh, failure. Um, which is to say that very few industries really adapted them. Probably the one story of success was the engineering industries. 63% of engineering factories had joint production committees. But those joint production committees were rarely involved in management decision making. Instead, joint production committees became associated with so-called tea and toilets. That is to say, the old workers' welfare issues of where do you get to eat, you know, how often you get to use the restroom, um, and, 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 and so forth. So the first tentative signs of the inadequacy or the failure of that, of that project. Now let's move on to the family, and I'm going to cover a lot of slightly different types of ground here. First thing I want to say is um, that the National Marriage Guidance Council had, which is now called RELATE, yeah? uh, it's where you get couples therapy, um, uh, was founded in 1938. Okay? And it was founded in 1938 by um, an Anglican priest who was alarmed by the, raising, the rise of divorce rates in the late 1930s. They were, however, as nothing compared to the rise of divorce rates um, uh, during and after the uh, Second World War. And you can see that basically four, oh, just over 4,000 divorces in 1935 leaps up to over 60,000 in 1947 and then continues at around 32,000 a year in the early 1950s. The family...